I think the key is, I'm going to come back to saying again, the thing you want to do is to train as often as you can without getting injured. And that's the key, without getting injured. If you can avoid picking up an injury and getting sick, you're doing a really good job. And 90% of the benefit is going to come from just getting out there and doing the training and not getting in your own way. That Triathlon Show 158. Hey, what's up, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of That Triathlon Show, the podcast presented by scientifictriathlon.com. I'm your host, Michael, and on today's episode, I interview coach Rob Wilby. Rob is a professional triathlon coach based in England, and he is the head coach at Team Oxygen Addict and also a podcast host of the popular Oxygen Addict Triathlon podcast, which many of you I'm sure are familiar with. And Rob's primary focus and uh, specialty area is to help age groupers make the most out of their training time, especially those that focus on the half and full distance races and and have a limited amount of, of training time to to use so we'll get into that and that's uh, yeah that's the topic of today's interview just before that i also want to quickly mention that rob interviewed me for the oxygen addict podcast so you can listen to to that interview it's already out and it's episode 205 on oxygen addict before we get into the interview this episode is sponsored by stack that you can find on stackzero.com And I am now riding on the Stack Zero Halcyon, their new smart trainer model. And I have to say that I am really looking forward to spending some quality time on it uh, over this winter. Last winter, I was uh, riding exclusively outdoors. And uh, while it was fun, it was great, except for when it was raining, which it uh, it does rain sometime here in Portugal. Uh, I do think that with indoor training, you can be really, really time effective. And that's something that, that I want to be more so this year than last year last year i was actually injured from running so so i had more time to spend but this year i do not carry any injuries touch wood so so i will have to be more effective with my time again this uh, falls nicely with today's interview actually uh, and the stack zero halcyon that's a fantastic trainer for me to do that on i've noticed that over my first few rides that i've done on it by the time of this recording and uh, I really look forward to getting more and more used to it and using all its functionality with the different apps that I'm also testing out. As uh, you heard in the last episode, I'm testing quite a few of them now, including uh, Swift and Ruby, both of which are completely new to me. So it's all good fun and you can get a Stack Zero trainer, either the Halcyon or one of their uh, more entry-level models uh, without the smart trainer functionality. And whichever model you choose, you can get 20% off with the discount code that triathlon show, all one word, all caps on stackzero.com. And big thank you to Roka and welcome back as a sponsor, Roka. Roka can be found on roka.com, that's R-O-K-A.com. And now they also have the UK and EU distribution. So no more import taxes uh, or customs, other unnecessary fees. You can buy directly through uk.roka.com or eu.roka.com or just navigate to those particular sites through the drop down menu with the flags that you'll see on the main website as well. So great news for all the European and United Kingdom, well, United Kingdom, so it still is part of the EU and will be part of Europe for the foreseeable future as far as i'm aware but great great news for all of us and if you are looking for wetsuit tri suit uh, swim equipment like uh, neoprene shorts buoyancy shorts uh, sunglasses goggles roca carry all of these items and many more that are of the highest quality and really 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 well researched and developed they spend a lot of time and money on the research and development to make the products best in class so definitely check them out might be something to give to your partner family friends for christmas if uh, they're looking for anything in those categories you can get 20 percent off your purchase uh, or your entire order with the promo code that triathlon show all one word all caps on roca.com all right now let's get into rob's interview and hear about his approach to effective winter training for time crunched athletes 
Today's guest on that triathlon show is Rob Willoughby from Oxygen Addict. Rob is a fellow coach and podcaster, and I'm sure many of the listeners will be familiar with the Oxygen Addict podcast. So it's great to have you here, Rob. Oh, Michael, thank you so much for inviting me on. It's uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm a long-time listener of the show, and uh, it's quite an honor to be asked on, man. I'm quite uh, quite excited about it. Well, me too, and uh, especially considering that the topic that we're going to talk about is one thing, something that is so, so relevant for almost all age group athletes, if not every single one of them, and, and that is uh, time-effective training, and we talked about this many times before on the podcast, and, and I want to basically pick your brains on how you work in that time effective framework for age group athletes especially now heading into winter so why don't you start with talking uh, from an overall uh, big picture perspective of how you maximize the effectiveness of your age group athletes training time yeah cool um well it's funny that you, you mentioned the whole time angle of it because over the years i've been i've been coaching triathlon now professionally for about 10 years and it's one of those things where over time, you kind of you hone in on what works best for your athletes over over the different seasons. And one of the recurring themes that I saw with a lot of the athletes that I coached, who of course ninety nine percent of them have got full time jobs and families to work around, is they're super super keen, but they don't have quite as much time to train as they would like. That's like that's almost a given at any point, right? Everybody would like more time, and so the key thing is trying to make their training as effective you can in the time that they've got. So over the years, I've come up with this framework for training, especially for age group athletes and especially for those who are training for 70.3 or Ironman distance. And I called it the time training system and the acronym TIME. It's firstly, it, it stands for all the things that I found were important in training, but it's named after time because that was like the, the one recurring angle in all of the athletes that I talked to that they really struggled with. So so yeah, the, the, the most important thing is making sure that our athletes get the most bang for the buck that they can out of whatever training time they've got, you know, essentially whether that's limited training time or not. So so let's uh, talk about that time acronym. What What does it stand for? Okay, so... In, in a basic form, we go with T-I-M-E. The T stands for test and evaluate. So the first thing we want to make sure is that we evaluate the time that an athlete's got and, and we say to them, like, honestly, how much time do you have to train? Let's really go into, be honest with yourself because you're going to get so much more effective training if you're trying to do the training plan that's realistic and that's written for the amount of time that you've got rather than going, well, I, I hope I've got 16 hours to train this week and I'll find that time somewhere. But actually, you know, they don't have that time in the first place. That's the first bit. Let's be honest in the evaluation. The second thing is that we, we want to test our athletes regularly in all the sports because you can't afford to train with guesswork. If you're limited with the time, you really need to know exactly where you are so that you're not going to waste any of your limited training time and make sure that the, atten the intensities that you're training at are always exactly the ones that are going to bring you the most improvement for the shortest amount of time. The I in the acronym stands for intensity or better, the intelligent use of intensity. So by that, I mean, we're going to use the appropriate intensities in both swim, bike and run at the appropriate times of year. And they're not always going to be the same. So depending on whether we're in winter, spring or in the race preparation phase, it's going to make more sense to do some intensities at other times of year. The M stands for mindset. And that's super important because I think the way that you approach your training and whether you've got confidence in what you're doing is so important. And I'm sure you've seen as a coach, it's the one thing that coaches can really help an athlete with is that reassurance that the thing that you're doing is proven. It's not going to waste your time and your athlete doesn't have to sit there reading through six or eight hours worth of blogs and articles every week to try and convince themselves that what they're actually doing is, is going to be the most effective way of training. And then the E stands for effective effort. So that ties all of it together, really. It's sort of saying to people, look, we want to make sure that Anything that you're doing in training is going to get you to your goal as quickly and as efficiently as possible. So just to recap there for, for the listeners, that was uh, test and evaluate. It's uh, intelligent use of intensity. It's mindset and uh, it's uh, effective. Sorry, what was that? Effective. Uh... Yeah, effective effort. It's, effective it's effort, effort, but it's like effective okay. use of yeah. effort is, yeah. is the key to it, it, really. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so uh, let's start with... Uh, 
with the well, I think the test and evaluate really it's quite self-explanatory. Uh, we can yeah, go into totally. the uh, the intensity part of it. I think that's and or actually before that, let, let's talk about what the training might look like again from a brief overview perspective in the different phases of training: winter, spring, and uh, race preparation for the seven point three and Ironman athletes. Yeah, absolutely. So I think that the key thing that that guides all of this is is this phrase like your goal is to be the fastest triathlete that you can be on race day. And all of your training should be aimed at that, making you cross from the start line to the finish line as fast as possible, not necessarily to be either the fastest swimmer or fastest biker or fastest runner you can be. And that's, it sounds kind of obvious to say it, but I think it gets lost in the wood for the trees angle sometimes. And that athletes get so focused on like, I need to be a faster swimmer. Actually, sometimes we need to take a step back and go, you've got X number of hours a week to train. What's the best way to use those hours of training in order that you can be the best athlete you can be come race day? So it might not always be to do tons of swimming, even if you're a weak swimmer, just because of the nature being the nature of triathlon being, you know, you're going to spend much more time on your bike on race day than you are in the water. Okay, so... My my approach to winter training first, if we talk about that, um, the key thing that I look for in my athletes over winter is that we're going to use the majority of their time to focus on the thing that's going to make the biggest difference to their overall race time. And so for both 70.3 and iron distance races, I focus on improving their bike power. That's like the headline figure. We're going to do two or three short but high intensity workouts focusing on raising the functional threshold power. Or if if your listeners aren't familiar with that, essentially it's it's how fast you can go over a four to, over a 40 kilometer time trial if you like what's the maximum power you can put out for an hour if we can raise that functional threshold power in our athletes we can be pretty certain that they're going to be faster for any given distance for the same sort of relative effort so in an ideal world i want my athletes get into springtime and when they go out for a ride with the mates after the long hard winter all of a sudden the friends that they used to ride with can't keep up with them anymore because to raise the functional threshold power in the winter, when they go outside for whatever was a you know a perceived exertion of five out of ten, they're now going two or three kilometers an hour faster for that same sort of perception of effort. So that's my number one focus of, of use of our training time in winter. It's those two or three focused bike sessions that they're going to do. And, and what what sort of intensity is if we uh, d- dig a little bit deeper into that? Would those two or three bike sessions be be ridden at? Great. Yeah. So I love jumping into the detail of this. So what I'll have is typically those two, the two key bike sessions of the week. I usually advise my guys to do them on a turbo trainer because then we can control a lot of the variables. And within a 60 minute session, including a warm up and a cool down, we're going to look for somewhere between 30 and 40 minutes of hard work, including rests. And so we're going to be looking at working at or around 100% of functional threshold power. And we're going to be looking at working in a ratio of about five minutes of work to one minute of rest. Now, that's a very oversimplified version of this. So a classic a classic session they might get might be six repetitions of five minutes working at 100% of threshold with a minute's recovery. And then, I mean, you can make the argument, you could have your athlete do that once a week for 16 weeks, and they're going to be a lot faster <laughs> at the end of the winter than at the start. But we know that people are going to get bored and we know that people are also going to need some progression. So we'll start them off with those chunks broken up into smaller chunks and we'll build them across that duration of the winter into longer chunks. So by the end of that winter, they definitely feel as though they can hold that 100% for a longer period of time. And they're also, um, you know, they get to the point where, uh, okay, to give you a better example, at the start of the winter, I might have them do, um, one minute, two minutes, three minutes, two minutes, one minute in a kind of little mini pyramid. That might be the introduction to the training at threshold. By the end of the winter, we might have them doing four sets of eight minutes or even three sets of 10 minutes at 100% of threshold. So the overall amount of work that they're doing at threshold might not change that much across that duration of time, but the, the longer chunks that they're doing within it are definitely going to help them hold that 100% of threshold for a longer time across the duration. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, so so uh, if we keep talking about the winter, spring and race prep training, then uh, let's talk about winter and uh, wrap that up with uh, the spring yeah, and yeah. the run training that you, that you do. 
So a lot of the a lot of the surprise in athletes that come to me for coaching is they come to me and say, "Look, the weakness in my in my race is always my run. I really want to help you to improve my run performance." And they're expecting to get tons of hard work on the run, and the plan that I give them almost always involves only running at a steady intensity. And they look at me and kind of go, how's this going to make me a better runner come race day? And again, I say, look, we've got to go back to the bigger picture. You've got to be the fastest trice that you can be on race day. And it's a, it's pretty much a given fact that the human body can only absorb so much threshold training in a given week. So if you look at a track runner, they might go out and do two threshold sessions a week on the track and the rest of it's all steady running. If you look at a, a time trialist in cycling, again, they might do two or three sessions of threshold in a week and then the rest of it's all steady riding. If you look at a swimmer, they might do two or three threshold sessions in a week and then the rest of it's all steady swimming. However, as triathletes, we tend to look at those three athletes and go, well, if I want to be a good swim, bike and runner, I need to do threshold sessions in swimming and biking and running every week. And lo and behold, the end result for a lot of self-coach triathletes is they're completely whipped and exhausted because they're trying to do too much threshold training in a week. So I say to my athletes, right, our aim of our run training is we're going to work on the durability of your body, the, the run specific ligaments, tendons, to a certain extent, the muscles as well. You're getting pounded just by going out for a run. That effect of gravity, having your body hit the ground with repeated foot strikes, we need to build that ability to train before we can train you. And your cardiovascular system is getting that threshold workout twice a week or even three times a week on the bike. So in cardiovascular terms, you don't need to be doing threshold work in the winter in running. You just need to be getting your body to the point where you can do lots of running without picking up injuries. And that's the number one goal. And so athletes get to the end of the winter, they do the first running race. And often they're really surprised that despite having done no fast running in the winter, they do a run PB in the first run back at the end of the winter because they're so much fitter cardiovascularly because of the bike training and they haven't picked up an injury because of uh, the, the plenty of steady running that they've done. So that's often an eye opener to people. The thing they think is going to make them faster at running isn't actually the thing that makes them faster at running. The key for improving your running is repeated running three or four times a week without getting injured. And the number one danger for getting injured is trying to run fast and hard, especially during the winter. So, so that would be like three or four runs of uh, how long? And and when you say steady running, it's just it's, it's normal easy endurance miles, or or is there a certain exactly that? Yeah, we don't overthink it. I'm I'm a big fan of using the Jack Daniels pace tables. Um, if people have seen that, then it's his e pace running. If you haven't seen that, it would be what would be classed as sort of low to middle zone two heart rate type running. So you're not going fast at all, but your body doesn't pick up any injuries because of that. You're not putting any stress on the, if you like, on the chassis of your body. And so you just absorb that volume really nicely. And, and uh, how long would those three to four runs per week be? Initially, during the winter phase, we're going to focus on runs of around 30 to 45 minutes. We'll have a longer run a week that starts at, say, 45 minutes, and it'll build in duration across that sort of 18-week winter block to get to the point our athletes are running a long run of about 90 minutes. But again we look at the best way we can use that training time. It's often not doing tons of long runs during the winter. Running short and more frequently, I think is better for athletes than doing just one or two longer runs during the winter. Mm. And and then the swimming, you've already alluded to uh, to sort of what you're what you're doing and what you're not doing and how much you're not doing. But uh, if, you, <laughs> yeah. if, if you bring that up and, and clarify exactly what the winter swim training might look like. So winter swim training for me, I tend to keep guys, If the, firstly, if they're really limited on time, they probably won't do very much swimming at all. So I won't have them in the pool three or four times a week if they're really time limited. I'll say to them, look, we can maintain your swim on maybe even one swim a week. And the swimming that you're doing, let's have you focus on really focused drill work and on building fitness as a byproduct of practicing perfect form. So again, in a perfect world, if my athletes got loads of time, yeah, they're going to go down and they're going to swim three times a week. But for most of my athletes, we look at how they can spend their, you know, their maybe seven hours of training a week. If they can get to the pool once a week during this winter phase, then great. They're going to maintain the swim biomechanics during the winter. And then we'll, we'll look at adding more swimming in as we go towards the goal race time. Hmm. So, uh, moving into the spring, then, how how do things change in the three disciplines? 
All right. So as we get into springtime on the bike, hopefully we've got to the point where we've raised our functional threshold over the winter. So we'll have done two nine week blocks in an ideal world. We tend to see a sort of six to 8% bump in FTP in each block for the majority of athletes. Now, some athletes might see more than that if they're new to sport. Most athletes are somewhere in that six to 8% range. So I think that's a key thing. We need to make sure that athletes are not I mean, we've all seen these things on the internet where you go, hey, you're going to have a 25% increase in your FTP over the winter. (laughs) And that'd be lovely if we could go out and all have that. And occasionally I have seen athletes who've had that, but they tend to be guys who are very new to the training. Um, If you can get two jumps of six to 8% over two blocks, then you're coming out of the winter with a really nice improved FTP of maybe maybe 15% higher than it was when you went in. So now as we go into spring, we're going faster for the same effort. We're going to reduce the amount of intensity we're doing on the bike. So typically one of our sessions a week is now going to be done at what's you know typically termed sweet spot so that kind of 90 percent of ftp give or take so we can do longer reps at 90 percent than we could at 100 and we can do more overall work at 90 percent than we could at 100 but you're still probably getting probably 95 percent of the benefit that you were at 100 percent. so it's much less stressful on your body but you can do more overall work there that's going to help kind of push your ftp up from underneath rather than pull it up from above if you like then the other thing we're going to do now is we're going to start working on specific leg strength so we'll do some big gear work on the bike so there's a couple of warnings here which i'll come back to but in general if our athletes are healthy and they've got no knee problems we're going to start doing so by low cadence i'm looking at 20 revs a minute lower than what they would consider to be their comfortable cadence we'll start with very simply a rep of a minute of high of of low cadence work um so say minute out of every three pushing a big gear we'll move to two minutes out of every five three minutes out of every five five minutes out of every ten so the athlete gets used to this idea of pushing a bigger gear and if they can ride outdoors this time of year great this makes a great session to do outdoors equally it works well on the turbo it works great outdoors if you're on sort of rolling hills and you can do the bigger gear work essentially it mimics what you would do if you're riding outdoors and you're on rolling terrain naturally most athletes cadence tends to drop a bit as they're going over these rollers so we're simulating that if athletes are indoors and it's really good at building specific leg strength and again we're going to start increasing the duration slightly of those longer rides that they'll do as we're in the spring phase and what what would the intensity of those low cadence uh, repetitions or low cadence workouts in general be would that also be around sweet spot or is it less uh, prescribed and more free form I tend to have them do it actually more in zone two. So the benefit that you see with the leg strength can come at relatively quite a low intensity. And it's something that our athletes have got to learn to do because if you say to anybody, here's an interval of three minutes, they go, right, I must push hard. But we try and avoid that and say, it's okay to do this in zone two heart rate, but pushing a bigger gear. And some athletes really find that difficult. You know, power tends to spike the minute we go to a lower cadence. So it's interesting for athletes to try and learn to push that bigger gear with with higher muscular force, if you like, without necessarily having to push at a, a sweet spot percentage. And again, we can start at lower percentages of intensity. And as the season gets closer, we can start to push slightly higher intensities with the athletes that it's more specific for. Mm, yeah. Okay. So the run and the swim done. Yeah, with run, what we're looking at here is now we've got to the point our body is nice and durable. We can, you know, we've got this big benefit from the increased aerobic performance from the bike training over the winter. We can start to add more duration into our runs now because we're confident we can absorb those without getting injured. And we also can start to introduce a little bit more intensity. So, For 70.3 athletes, this is where we're going to start doing some progressive runs, building to kind of 70.3 goal race pace, which at this point in the year is probably going to be quite challenging still in, you know, in training on your own, certainly. With my Ironman athletes, I like to say to athletes, look, let's let's bear in mind that you don't necessarily have to run that much faster than your goal race pace in training. And for most athletes, goal race pace in an Ironman isn't that fast. And the challenge is that they'll say to you, you know, let's let's take a, a good standard age grouper who's who's looking at performing pretty well in his age group and he's looking at running, say, let's say a three hour fifteen marathon off the bike, which in most age groups is going to be pretty competitive. That's still only seven and a half minute miles. 
Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And a lot of athletes will kind of look at you and go, well, I, I, I think I need to be running faster than that. Actually, no, that isn't specific to how you're going to race on race day. So why use your valuable training beans in the wrong way in training? Let's have you be really specific and use the intensity in the most intelligent way. So, so you're basically banking still a lot on the on the bike and doing more of the intensity on the bike and and not putting it on the run. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, in, in in an ideal world, I want my athlete to think: if I've got more run training in me, I'd rather do it in terms of more volume than in terms of more intensity, because we want to program our bodies to be able to run comfortably at you know, let's say that that goal was seven and a half minute miles for our really good age grouper for a lot of our athletes it's going to be a goal of you know to run a 330 marathon in an ironman is is it doesn't sound hard on practice and pretty much everybody goes yeah i think i'm going to be able to do that as anybody who's tried to do it it's not hard for the first half of the marathon it can get really challenging for the back half of the ironman marathon so what we want to be doing to them is is challenging them in the right way in training to be able to hold that pace rather than having them doing you know much harder running in training that isn't really going to be that specific for their goal race distance yeah and and for for most athletes that are not at the top end of the age group it's it's soon too uh that uh that they're going to be running at and maybe the the top age totally. groupers would be at uh low zone three or something like that but uh but it's totally. yeah, you're right it's not very intense i'll give you an example from my own my own competitive career back in the day 2008 i raced at the uh the world championships at itu distance uh the long distance race that was in almira in holland and um long story short did what a lot of guys do you get in a competitive race i went far too hard on the bike blew myself to bits got onto the run and i was i was really struggling to run eight minute miles and i was running next to an american guy who looked super super fit i've got a photograph of us running side by side and the pair of us are you know like that that kind of peak fitness really ripped we look great but we're struggling to run eight minute miles and he he said to me dude i've never run this slow in training And that was like a light bulb moment to me, which was like a lot of people at the time, I was going out and doing tempo runs at sub six minute miles. And then come race day, I couldn't get anywhere near that kind of speed, partly because I'd blown myself apart on the bike. But even the guys who were the fastest in my age group, this was like a 30K run. And I think the fastest run was two hours, 15, say. So 45 minute 10Ks back to back, less than not even seven minute miling pace. And I'd been training much, much faster than that. And it made me think, why have I been training in a way to go much faster than I'm going to actually go on race day? Because most of us are not going to be do that. So I could have used that training intensity much more intelligently in training, worked harder on the bike and got my bike fitness up. And then maybe I wouldn't have blown myself to bits on the bike. <laughs> I think this is very interesting. And, uh, but uh, playing the devil's advocate here, because it's, it's quite different from, from what I do in terms of run tra- training and what I coach. Yeah. So, so what, why do you think that it's not beneficial to, for example, train to increase your running threshold or your running VO2 max, and then you will be able to keep those lower intensities more comfortably uh, what because you have increased the the ceiling basically of what you can achieve yeah i mean i i totally agree with that if if we take a step back and we look at the bigger picture i think um my approach has always been to look at the body as a whole and go aerobically and cardiovascularly our vo2 max and our threshold is getting lifted by all the training that we're doing whether it's swim bike or run it all affects that central system so if i've raised my threshold by training on the bike i'm also going to have raised that threshold in terms of my body's ability to you know a simple terms to buffer lactate i'm going to have done that by very hard training on the bike and I, i absolutely agree you can skin the cat lots of different ways and you can have your athlete go out and do lots of fast running. And that will also have the effect of either raising VO2 max or raising threshold. But my worry is always, are we increasing their susceptibility to injury and illness? And with our athletes that are bomb proof, there's no problem with them doing that. But with a lot of the athletes I've worked with over the years, the limiting factor has not been their ability to do that or they're not been their 
desire to do the work. It's been their ability to absorb the work and not get injured. So I think the safest way to do it is to have them do the work on the bike where there's a much more minimized risk of injury. And then that r- the running training can then become much more about specific training of ligaments, tendons, durability to absorb volume without injury sure no that's that's a really good good explanation of of the approach and uh definitely uh very interesting and uh and something that i can see how it makes sense and uh and how it how it works so well for for the athletes that you coach definitely and uh it's great to debate this isn't it because there are so many there are so many different ways of training people and Lots of them are very, lots of them are very effective. I think the key thing to being an effective coach is finding the way that works for the athlete that you're working with and, and giving them confidence that what you're doing with them is going to help them in the long term. Absolutely. There are so many different ways. And, uh, like I recently remember having some conversations with, uh, with some listeners on the podcast about how, uh, they had been training a lot really based on vo2 max and quite low volume training but a lot of vo2 max work on both the the bike and the run and and also the swim i think i don't remember specifically specifically about the swim but that is also yeah. on on the other end of the spectrum uh quite a kind of an extreme way of training not necessarily extreme but a very different way of training but uh they yeah. have seen great results from that and they also had very good explanations for why it why it works and but as you say it, it depends on that is definitely something that uh, somebody who is susceptible to injuries might not do very well on. And I know personally, even though I might not get injured, I would get overtrained on that type of training because I really don't do well with that zone five work, although I can do really well with a lot of threshold uh, work yeah. and, and <laughs> tempo zone free work on both the, the bike and the run. So there, there's a big spectrum and, and a lot of points along that spectrum that might work. Totally. Yeah. And what I'd say to the listeners is experiment on yourselves and and find out what works for you because there are some athletes, um, I've interviewed Joe Skipper, for example, on the podcast a few times. And Joe is an athlete who is definitely an outlier because he can go and do threshold training in pretty much every sport, pretty much every day and bounce back from it day to day. And, And I think that's just unbelievable from the context of the athletes I've worked with. Most of them, if they come down to, you know, a running track session and they do a 30 minute main set of threshold running say they do that five reps of six minutes on the track at threshold that's got a great effect on the cardiovascular system but the next day they wake up really sore and they they, firstly they have to have a day off running and secondly they have to have an easy day of cycling because their muscles are really sore from it whereas if they do that same session on the bike you can make the argument that on the cardiovascular system they've had the same training stimulus but most people get up the day after a threshold training session on the bike and they feel completely fine to train again. So it's also, I think, looking at what allows you to get the most training done in a week relative to the time you've got. Um, and another thing, Michael, I'm I'm 46 this year. The, the amount of running that I can do that's hard these days compared to 15 years ago, it breaks my heart. <laughs> <laughs> I only have to arrive at the gates of a, of a running track these days to get sore. So that's a big eye opener for me is that when we're coaching aging athletes, when we get into the 40s, we really have to be aware that not everybody can absorb sessions in the same way. And it's definitely something I was guilty of in my younger days of coaching when I was, you know, my early thirties, I'd be coaching guys in the mid forties. And it, it took me a while to realize they don't feel the same as I do the day after this session, you know? So it's, it's given the appropriate training to the appropriate athlete at the right time as well, I think. Yeah, that example with Joe Skipper is, is so interesting because I think that especially on, in long distance racing that when we talk about genetically gifted athletes, I, I don't think yeah. it's that you need to have uh, a predispos- predisposition for a high VO2 max or anything like that. It's you need to be genetically gifted in how well you recover and bounce back for sessions and do right. a lot of hard work. Yep. exactly and and that thing you said about like really hard training in terms of vo2 max it can have a great effect on your fitness but it can make you it can have a really bad effect on your immune system so if an athlete tries to train really hard and then gets a cold or gets sick as you you alluded to with yourself joe just doesn't get that he doesn't he doesn't get sick he can just bounce back time after time whereas with most people it's one of those like experiment with yourself but be honest if it isn't working you need to shift to something that is working, I think. Yeah. So let's quickly talk about the swim training during spring, and then we can uh, jump into the race prep period, the last few uh, months before the race. 
Totally. So with our swim training in the springtime, what we're looking at doing is we're now going to start making use of the fact you've got improved swim mechanics due to your, your technique work in the winter. We start to swim a bit more frequently and the sessions are going to be a mix of still working on specific drills to address whatever limiters you've got, but now starting to introduce a little bit more volume and a little bit more intensity. So typically in this phase, my one hour sessions are going to be broken down into 20-ish minutes of specific drill practices and then a 20 to 30 minute main set with a mix of either endurance main set or some some limited threshold type training at this time of year as well so we start to build the swim fitness by training hard as well as training our technique yeah and uh, then the race prep period if we go through the disciplines in in that phase let's let's call it the last two months or so before the race or whatever period you want to, to go with yeah, so, so typically my, my in inverted commas race prep phase will be about 12 weeks long. And what we'll do with the athletes here is we say, okay, and, and we're talking, I'm going to be clear here, we're talking about long distance athletes racing 70.3 or Ironman. The most specific training at this time of year is to get them used to the big challenge of race day. And the big challenge is how long they're going to be out there for, especially for our iron distance racers. The actual pace they're going to hold on race day isn't really the challenge for them because for most people if you if you get them to go out and ride at Ironman intensity or run at Ironman intensity or even swim at Ironman intensity relative to what they're honestly going to do on race day that intensity is not going to be that challenging for them it's their ability to do that for the duration of time so now is the point where I'm going to say to people look I've been talking about smart use of time all the way through our training plans this is a time you're now honestly going to have to carve some more time out of your week because the way you're going to prepare for your long distance races is training with longer volumes so in all of our efforts now we're going to be building the duration to get closer to the time we're going to be training for on race day and the intensity is going to more closely match the time that you're going on race day so i'm still going to have them do one sweet spot session a week on the bike to try and sort of increase that top end power or at least hold that top end power there but the rest of it the intensities are going to drop down to be more like they'll do on ironman race day again for 70.3 athletes we'll have them do some intervals that will more specifically mimic their 70.3 70.3 race distance but the key thing that i'm going to do with my athletes during this race preparation phase is we're going to do one or maybe two race preparation weekends where they're going to do a broken if you like a broken iron man or a broken half iron man across a weekend so long swim friday night long bike ride followed with a run off the bike on saturday long run very first thing sunday morning So what you're trying to do here is you're trying to mimic the demands of race day. So most people can carve out the time just a couple of times to go away and do a really long swim Friday night for our Ironman distance races. So they're going to do four, four and a half K in the pool. Then they're going to get up. They're going to ride six hours on the bike. And then straight away, they're going to run 45 minutes off the bike. Then they're going to recover for the rest of the day. And then first thing Sunday morning, they're going to get out and do the long run. So again, for the Ironman distance races, they're going to run for two hours very first thing Sunday morning. And with that, they're going to have covered a, pretty much the entire Ironman duration over what's not much more than about a 30-hour period. So if we time that workout correctly and we've got the training right in the lead up to that, that's going to give our athletes a really good sense of how fast they can realistically go on the bike on race day um, because you know most people are really bad at judging that and they'll go out on what feels easy but it's much too hard and trying to do a six hour Ironman paced ride the last two hours of that are a really good guide as to whether you've actually gone at a pace that's achievable on race day or not yeah okay absolutely so make, makes sense and and in that outside of those long weekends like how long would your athletes train on the weekends for example when you probably have the long sessions on a more normal weekend in this last period well, we're going we're gonna to build up to the point where the long ride is going to be six hours. Um, it might be a little bit shorter than that for our faster athletes and make it a bit more specific. So if they're you know expecting to do a 445 bike leg, the ride might be a bit shorter than that. But oftentimes I'll have them do a longer ride anyway, because, you know, let's not, let's not mix messages here. They're going to be out there on race day for, you know, let's say nine hours for our fastest athletes, 10 hours, 11 hours, 14 hours, 15 hours. We need them to get used to training for an extended period of time. So the long ride is going to go to about six hours. The long run will go to a maximum 
of two hours, 45, maybe three hours for some athletes. But again, what I find is it's it's better for athletes to do several weeks of a repeated two and a half hour run rather than trying to do one three and a half hour run and be completely wrecked for three or four days afterwards. So we're always trying to train with the next day in mind. And one tip I'll give athletes here is I only ever have my athletes do their long run the day after the long bike on those specific race preparation weekends because the rest of the time I actually like to split those up. So they'll do the long ride on Saturday and they'll do the long ride on a Wednesday or a Thursday. So they're doing the long run on fresh legs, again, thinking about minimizing injury risk. And then they're going to do the long ride at the weekend when they've got more time. Yeah, I think that's that's a really smart approach. I really like that uh, that idea, definitely. And uh, It's hard, isn't it, man? And we've, we've all done those those hell weekends where you've tried to do like, six hour ride saturday three hour run sunday and by sunday lunchtime you're lying on the on the sofa wondering what day it is <laughs> because you're so completely wrecked and it takes the rest of the week to recover so so that's my overall guiding principle here with the time training system is we're trying to train in a way that you can train again the next day you're never putting yourself into a massive hole where you're completely wrecked yeah yeah totally i, I think i have a an episode on um on this it might be in one of my beginner tip episodes actually where, where i talk about the concept of optimizing for the whole week or or the whole meso cycle yeah, rather than optimizing for that. single workouts and you you don't want to it depends on what type of athlete you are and what race you're training for but especially for long distance racing you very rarely should do like best effort workouts you should get the job done but you should feel that you have something left in the tank so that you can still go out and do the work the, the next day couldn't agree more most athletes tend to underestimate what they can do in a week and overestimate what they can do in a day and it's that repeated no one's going to get good at Ironman in three months you know what I mean it's a it's a repeated process of enjoying what you do day after day and never getting yourself sick ill or injured yeah so if we talk a bit about the winter because that's the the period we're heading into what and and we start wrap this discussion up with uh an example week, a typical week for, for a 70.3 or Ironman age grouper as they are, let's say, in the middle of the winter period, not the very beginning, not the very end. So so what would a typical week look like in terms of how many hours, how many workouts per discipline, etc.? Yeah, got yeah. Okay, so what we'll typically do is we'll sketch a week out and we'll say, um, I'll kick off with Monday being a rest and recovery day because I think at the end of the week, the most important thing is to make sure we're recovered. So plan that in first completely rest and recovery focused day so there's two ways to approach that if you're the kind of swimmer that is a relatively decent swimmer and you can do a recovery swim and feel better at the end of it go and do that it's like a free massage if you're a beginner swimmer and any kind of swim workout is a real hard effort for you stay out of the water so focus on doing what you need to do to recover and then typically we'll do our threshold workouts on the bike on Tuesday and Thursday. And then we'll do a longer ride on Saturday. That's ideally we're going to go outdoors and ride for up to three hours. If not, I'll give them a 90 minute turbo session indoors. That's going to include some sweet spot work. So that's the biking covered. That's Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday. We'll then have them do steady runs Wednesday, Friday, and Sunday. So again, Early winter, it might be two runs of 30 minutes and a 45-minute long run, and we'll build to two runs of 45 minutes and a 90-minute long run. And then we'll schedule our key swim for the week on that Wednesday, probably, so that they'll do a mix of you know, real technique-focused work and then maybe a little bit of, of quality swimming as we progress through the winter. If they've then got more time, we'll add in an endurance based swim on the Friday as well. So that gives us a total week that looks like Monday is a recovery day with maybe a recovery swim Tuesday and Thursday as bike focused days, Wednesday, you've got that swim and run Fridays. You've got a run and maybe an additional swim Saturdays, longer bike Sundays, longer run. And and how many hours in total would, would that be roughly? That'll work out at about seven hours a week for most athletes across the across the winter. Um, depending on how long the duration of that long ride is outdoors, it's going to be anywhere from the sort of five and a half to eight hour range. Okay, got it. So one thing that I meant to ask with the swimming and the technique focus in the winter actually is uh, how do you recommend that? Because I think many age groupers, especially more beginner swimmers, they they know that they need to work on technique, but they have no idea how to do it. They might yeah. watch some random drills on YouTube and do them, but they don't know why they're doing them and probably do them incorrectly and maybe not 
get the benefits that they should from that technique work. So yeah. in, in some ways, I think you almost need to be an advanced swimmer to get a lot of benefit from, from doing a lot of technique work. But it depends on the, the mindset that you bring into the swim sessions as well, because I do have some beginner athletes that have a great attitude and are really focused, but, but it's really, it really varies. So what's your recommendations for age groupers to get the most out of technique training? How, how do you work that into the programs of the athletes you coach? I'll tell you what, man, we could spend the whole interview on this, couldn't we? You're dead <laughs> right. It's, <laughs> it's, it's a hard one for people to improve the swimming without some specific guidance. And so my first thing is, if you can find a club that's got a good swim coach and who can watch your swim, go and, go and do that. Just get a bit of feedback from somebody. If you can have underwater swim analysis done, have somebody do that for you. Even if it's just your friend filming you and you look at what you're actually doing rather than what you think you're doing you can then compare that to the perfect model and, and see what changes you need to make but um now listen i've got no affiliation with this company other than thinking they're fantastic but if people haven't checked out the stuff that's available for free at swimsmooth.com yes <laughs> paul there is just he's got such a great program and, and like they they provide the coach education stuff that we teach um for british triathlon coach education he's got a set of specific drills that if people cycle through them, they're going to feel immediately whether this drill is going to help them. Things like the fist drill, the 636 drill, especially the unco drill is my favorite, although everyone hates it. Um, that will really help athletes break down their stroke and see what they need to improve. Um, but in, in general, what I say to people is if you do one length of drill and one length of swim, if you're not feeling like something's improving in your swimming, you need to get the help of a professional who can look at you and tell you exactly what the drill is that's going to help take you through that that um, that plateau. Yeah, I, I agree. I think that's something that uh, everybody should do, really. But but also, I I'm a totally a totally a fan of, of Swim Smooth. I'm a paying customer of the Swim Smooth Guru platform. Oh, it's awesome, so, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I highly recommend it to to anybody, whether whether you have that that swim coach or an overall triathlon coach or or not it's it's really great really good explanations of the drills why you do them how you should do yeah. them great videos great quality yeah really really impressive F finally final question before we move into the rapid fire questions do you have any other tips that we haven't talked about yet for helping the age group athletes that listen to this episode be more time efficient with their training I think I think the key is, I'm going to come back to saying again, the thing you want to do is to train as often as you can without getting injured. And that's the key, without getting injured. If you can avoid picking up an injury and getting sick, you're doing a really good job. And 90% of the benefit is going to come from just getting out there and doing the training and not getting in your own way. So if you tend to go a bit slower rather than a bit harder, that's going to mean you're probably going to have more success in the long term. If you then do your intensity stuff intelligently and you monitor those improvements as you go along, that's going to give you the biggest overall bang for your buck. Brilliant. All right. So then the rapid fire questions that uh, you know very well by now, having listened to the show, yeah, let's yeah. start with what's your favorite book, blog or resource related to triathlon? Uh, it's going to go back a few years, this one, but uh, Gordo Burns stuff. Gordo kept a, a weekly blog and, and a lot of listeners probably won't know him. Gordo was a an age grouper who very quickly got really good at Ironman and uh, back in the early 2000s finished second overall Ironman Canada and he kept an overall blog weekly of what he did to go from... I don't know, he was like a mid-12 hours Ironman guy when he did his first one to get down to 8.30 at Ironman Canada. And I just loved reading his blog every week. And I still go back. I, I wish he'd pull it together into a book because it, it would make the greatest story. Um, and he's got a book as well called Going Long, which I, I've read from cover to cover about 100 times. So that's my favorite stuff. I'm a big fan of his. Great. Yeah, I have that book as well, but I haven't checked out his blog. I know his story, but he was a bit before my triathlon time. So I, I need to, to look those things up. It sounds very interesting. He's awesome, man. Yeah. What's your favorite piece of gear or equipment? Uh, my running shoes. No question. I think... As I get older, I get the most benefit. I mean, we've talked all this stuff about training and performance. It's easy to lose sight of the fact that we do this because we enjoy moving in nature. And that's what it's all about for me. Get the running shoes on and, and go what, out and run and through what the what running shoes do you have? Do you have any particular preference as for what brand and model? Uh, do you know, it's just the, the Solomon Speedcross Varios at the moment. I've stumbled across those. A mate of mine, Matt Rushbrook, put me onto them and they're super comfy. And um, yeah, love nice. them. 
And finally, who's somebody in triathlon that uh, you look up to? Um, as well as having mentioned Gordo, who's moved out of coaching so much these days, um, I'm a really big fan of the guys at Swim Smooth. Paul Newsom, I went on one of his uh, swim coach education courses many, many years ago. And to this day, it was one of the most profoundly affecting courses I've been on. I think he's a fantastic example of someone who can get he can get information across to people really simply, information that might be really complicated. He can put it across in a really simple way. And um, yeah, I think they're a great company. Yeah, I, I agree. And, and we'll link to the episodes. I have a two-part interview with Paul Newsom, episode 132 and 33, I think it is. So I'll link to that in the in the show notes so that listeners can go and listen to that. It's well worth a listen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Superb guy. All right. Thank you so much, Rob. It was uh, really great to, to have you on and talk about uh, the time of uh, effective training and uh, tell the listeners where they can find out more about you, your coaching and uh, your podcast, everything you got going on. Yeah, so it'd be great if you pop on over to oxygenaddict.com. Um we've got a weekly triathlon podcast um that's got a slightly different focus to yours. We we tend to do more interviews on on pros and racers and and people like that. So it's a nice contrast to the the information that you give out on your great show. And um you can also check out Team Oxygen Addict, which is um Obviously, I spent many years coaching people on a one-to-one basis. Team Oxygen Addict is like a group coaching environment where um, we've got a whole bunch of pre-written training plans, but we try and stream people as they come in so they get the training plan that's appropriate to them. And my sort of catchphrase with that is 99% of the benefit of one-to-one coaching at about half the price. So um hopefully we've got something there for anybody who's looking to get themselves into the coaching arena brilliant and uh that will also be linked to in the show notes and the episode description so that the listeners can can find it all right Thanks, man. thank you so much rob it was uh, great having you on and uh, have a great rest of your day and listen i just want to say thank you to you for having me on i've i've loved listening to your show over the years and i think you do a great job and, and like i said it's been a, it's been a great honor to be invited on and um and i hope it's been helpful to listeners I think so. Thank you so much for the kind words. Bye. Thank you, mate. Hope that you enjoyed that interview. And uh, we discussed a lot of details and uh, specifics, which is great. I really like it when when my guests provide examples, example week, weekly plans, etc. Like uh, Rob did. And uh, especially we went into detail with the winter training and how Rob structures the winter training for his athletes. So I think it's definitely worth going back and listening to this again and making sure that you get to those details. But the one main takeaway that I want to leave you with today, you actually already heard uh, in the, the outtake from today's episode, and that is to avoid getting injured and avoid getting sick at all costs. It's uh, a different way of saying consistency, that old boring uh, thing that you hear time and time again, but it is so important. And this is something that I actually, I want to uh, pull together some data, some stats, and try to quantify how important that consistency is from the athletes that I coach. Uh, And uh, if I do, when I do, I I might share my findings in in an episode. So, uh, but we'll see, that's still on the to-do list. But anyway, that is my main takeaway. Avoid getting injured and avoid getting sick. You can find the show notes from today's episode on thattriathlonshow.com. And if you have questions or comments, please leave them there in the comment section. I get too much email already, so I cannot answer email on a specific, uh, specific episodes uh, individually. I want to answer them so that everybody can read them on those comment sections. And your question might already be answered if you had any question if you go and look at those comments, comment sections. Do check out the Oxygen Addict podcast and uh, the website. All of it will be linked to in the show notes. There are plenty of really good content on, on the podcast. And, and if you're interested in the coaching, check out Team Oxygen Addict as well. In the next episode, I will interview Cyril Schmidt, PhD, who you actually heard last episode where he talked about, no, two episodes ago, where he talked about his training platform, Gutai. And uh, in the next episode, we will talk about non-functional overreaching, which is one of the topics that Cyril investigated in his PhD. And it is a topic close to my heart because I've suffered from it uh, on a couple of occasions pretty severely uh, this season, actually. And I will talk about my personal experience with this as well. 
so look forward to that. Stay subscribed. If you are new to the podcast especially, make sure that you are subscribed so that you get all the new episodes as they are released. But also go back and check out all the archives. Again, you can find them in your podcast app or on thattriathlonshow.com. Just click through to see all podcast episodes and listen to all the gems from way back when that you find interesting. Some of the most popular ones that I would recommend are the interviews with Paul Newsom from Soon Smooth and the one with Carlson Christen from Try Sado and Matt Fitzgerald's The Endurance Diet episode. Those are all in the top most downloaded episodes that I have, so definitely recommend checking those out. If you have been listening for a while, please help me grow the podcast by telling your friends, telling your teammates, your coach, your athletes, anybody that might be interested about it. It really is a massive help whenever you do that, even if you just get one person to listen to one episode. Finally, big thanks to Stack for helping keep this podcast going. You can find Stack on stackzero.com. That's S-T-A-C, zero spelled out, dot com. And they make the world's quietest indoor bike trainers with no wear and tear on the bike, the tire of the bike, because they use magnets instead of resistance flywheels. It folds really nicely. You can store it under your bed, which is what I do, because I live in a small room and not in a big apartment. Uh, so it has many, many great features and benefits. So do check it out. They have three different models with different levels of uh, of features and different price points. So there's a model for everybody there. And of course, take 20% off your order with the promo code that travel show, all one word, all caps. And big thank you to Roka now with UK and EU distribution. Check them out on roka.com and take 20% off your entire order with the promo code that triathlon show, all one word, all caps. Thank you as always for listening. Keep training smart and keep loving triathlon.